really it's, it's for any questions. Are there any points anyone wants to raise on this matter? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, moving on then to item 4A, standing financial instructions and financial limits. And uh, John Connolly, the ICB's Executive Director of Finance, is going to introduce this item. Yes, thank you. Um, so we are required as an ICB to adopt standing financial instructions, or SFIs for short, and financial limits. Um, the first part of this, the SFIs, they're the financial framework under which we uh, operate and a key part of our control environment. There's some narrative in the, in the paper as to why this is important, but I should say, although there's quite a lot of detail in here, this, again, is effectively a standard, a standard document uh, based on a national template. Um, it's been produced by a group led by uh, a CTG CFO and supported by the governance leads of the CCGs. Uh, the main changes actually are in post titles, for example, um, CFO to, to Executive Director of Finance. The second part is financial limits, so if you think of the SFI as, 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 as what and, and, and how, this bit is, is, is the who and, and how much. Um, these again have been prepared by uh, a group led by a CCG CFO uh, and are effectively an aggregate of previous CCG arrangements. We have been fairly cautious, I think, with the limits because this is a, a, a new organisation and we know that both these documents will be um, tested and will develop over time. What I'm asking is for a board approval for both documents. Is everybody content to approve that? Good. Thank you very much. Um, moving on then um, to item 4B, which is the scheme of reservation and delegation. Claire. Um, again, Chair, uh, there's a common theme. It is a standard document and uh, it is something that we have to approve at today's board. It sets out responsibilities and functions, re what is reserved to our, our board, what is uh, delegated through our committees or individuals uh, um, for approval from the board, please. Okay, again, any comments or questions? Are you content to approve that? Thank you very much. I should have a gavel to bang after these <laughs> things. I do, I do miss that, um, but um, there we are. Then we move to the establishment of the board committee structure and appointment of committee chairs. And I'll ask um, Sam Allen, our chief executive, to, to cover this item. But just to say, first of all, it's a very important, as you, many of you are very experienced in boards, um, the subcommittees are a very important part of the business of the board. And so um, we get uh, gave a lot of consideration to how this should work. We had some guidance that we had to follow, but um, go ahead, Sam. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in terms of this item, another item for approval by the board today, which is the establishment of the ICB board committees, um, of which an operating model is proposed that there are five committees an Audit and Risk Committee, a Remuneration Committee, an Executive Committee, a Quality and Safety Committee, and a Finance Performance and Investment Committee. Within the paper, there is a table that sets out the proposed chairing arrangement. Four of these committees to be chaired by independent non-executive directors, with the Executive Committee chaired by myself. Also within there is the proposed membership um, and exemptions. Over the next week, um, we will be populating this with names and agreeing the names of the chairs of these committees, uh, Chair. So uh, this item is simply to approve the um, proposed board committee structure. Any questions or comments about this one? No. Yes, please, go ahead, Ken. We'll make that adjustment. Thank you. Yes, please. The different subcommittees, or how will that look, just in terms of populating those meetings? So, in, in terms of populating the meetings with the membership, we'll be working that up with the corporate governance team over the next uh, week, Tom, and, and we'll let you know. 
um, about that in terms of the, the membership um, as detailed in um, the enclosure 4C that sets out um, the, the proposed membership of that. It will, these committees will be populated with executive members of the integrated care board. And as I said, four of the five will be chaired by independent non-executive directors. Um, what I would um, propose we do, Chair, is circulate the proposed membership to members of this board for information. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Right, and it looks like everybody's happy then to proceed with that um, structure. Um, then we move on to item 4D, which is a separate aspect, the terms of reference. Yes, yeah, so notwithstanding um, Ken's point, uh, the terms of reference for the committees that we've just discussed are detailed within the papers. Um, uh, again, uh, many follow a standard template. They are in line with NHSE guidelines and they've been developed in partnership across the North East and North Cumbria uh, corporate governance colleagues. Again, are you happy to agree to that? Good, thank you. Um, now the next item, 4E. I mean, there is a, a lot of detail in this, and so I'd like to just make a comment about um, the overall situation with these uh, policy documents which cover uh, key and high-risk areas, uh, strategies and policies. Now, it's necessary for us to adopt these, um, which are clinical commissioning group procedures and policies, in order to keep um, continuity of business. And, um, and services, actually, in some cases. But um, these have not been reviewed fully in an integrated care board context. And um, some of them I know that individual members would probably want to uh, discuss in more detail. And there may be points which there's a need for adjustment. Uh, some of them are um, a few years old and may need to be modernized and, and brought up to date. So what we would propose that um, if you're happy to agree that these should be agreed for the time being, that we would bring them back um, in modified form uh, to a meeting in the near future so that you have the opportunity not just to see um, the, the finished version, but also to discuss and debate any of them. And if I could also ask that if any members have an interest or comments to make about a particular policy in this list, that they would let us know so that we have the opportunity to uh, take on board your, your advice on how we should be proceeding. Um, a classic example would be the serious um, incident management policy where um, I think the, there have been changes in thinking both na nationally and internationally about how this whole subject should be addressed and it, we could benefit from looking at that through uh, a more up-to-date lens, I think. But I'm very happy if you want to, if you want to pick up any particular of these policies now and, and say anything or ask any questions about them. Okay, and you're happy with that way of handling it. Thank you. Just I should have uh, just reminded everybody, if you do do want to speak, just so that we, we can see, you do put your, it's an, the equivalent of the hands up sign on Teams, which is um, um, life imitating art or vice versa or whichever way you might want to put it. Thank you very much. Now, um, this is one of the, um, I think, let's put, put it, the more interesting papers on the agenda. Um, the People and Communities Involvement and Engagement Framework, uh, f published in 2022. Um, and... Um, Claire, again, you're going to introduce this, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, firstly, just to uh, pay tribute to the engagement leads across the North East and North Cumbria 
um, uh, engagement network uh, under leadership with Julie Clayton, who now doesn't work for the NHS, but I think it's important that we pay tribute to their work and, and Julie's leadership as part of the development of the um, of a nationally required document that, that was nationally expected to come to our board today. Um, and and they, it has been confirmed by NHS England that this is one of the best that they have seen to date um, as part of the integrated care system submissions. Um, I think it sets the ambition and the drive um, and the motivation for, for uh, what we want to be able to achieve as an integrated care board, but also for our integrated care system. Um, whilst there is still lots to be done um, and lots of work to be done with partners, we've had some really good and helpful engagement across partners, including Health Watch, and I know we have Health Watch represented today. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm conscious people would have read the paper. I don't want to necessarily go through it page by page. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that the team have been able to do in such a short period of time. Thank you very much, Claire. David. Thank you. Um, thanks to Claire and her colleagues for uh, a document, and she mentioned the word proud, and I think she can be proud of that because it is very, very, very comprehensive in how it sets out how the voice of the people you know, can, be, can be heard within the ICB place and everywhere in between. The intentions are very clear, Claire, and to be commended. But in these, these early days, during this transition period, could you perhaps give some, some thoughts as to how you might translate those very, very good intentions into practice and meaningfully engage with the, the wider public? Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Claire. Yeah. yeah. And Jacqueline, you might want to say something from strategy point of view, but go ahead first, Claire. Yeah, thanks, David. I think it's important to recognise that there's still uh, really excellent work happening at a place-based level, and and some of the engagement leads that are that have been historically embedded in the clinical commissioning groups, have done a huge amount of work with voluntary sector organisations and communities over the years, and I think that's certainly something to build on, uh, David. And, and it's recognition that we're not starting from a base of zero and that some of the things that are already documented in the plan is work that is happening, happening really effectively in systems now. What we're doing is really looking at where else, what's next and what, what will be new. And I think that is where working with partners like yourself, working with um, other voluntary sector organisations too, to make sure that we, we have an ongoing conversation um, and a constant dialogue around the health and care system uh, with our population. And, and that is something that we need to do. And I think hopefully that sets the ambition there. But also it's recognition that we need to understand what people are seeing about us uh, and making sure that we track that and, work, uh, and making sure that as a health system we are visible in the communities that we serve. And also make sure that we reference or, or at least can demonstrate the impact that what we have heard has had on services. So it is early days. There are pockets that are happening across local communities uh, now. Um, but what we do have is um, a really great network internal to the system. Um, we have really great connections with uh, our partners. And I think in working together, we'll be able to get to the right place. And Jacqueline, you're going to be leading on the development of our first strategy. I just wondered if you wanted to say how this might fit into your, th your thinking on that. Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I think this uh, engagement uh, framework is uh, really, really helpful. Uh, as uh, many board members will know, uh, integrated care boards are uh, required to work with their integrated care partnerships to develop an integrated care strategy. Um, lots of integration there, <laughs> is the title. By December 22, uh, and uh, I've uh, agreed with, with Liam and Claire that we'll bring forward uh, not only a process for developing that strategy to the first meeting of the Integrated Care Partnership later this month, but also specifically uh, communications, engagement and co-production uh, plan that will sit alongside the development of that strategy so that from the get-go uh, folks can see how they can get involved in the, you know, the creation of this really key uh, strategy for us uh, as an integrated care um, system. So I look forward to uh, having many opportunities to talk to people from, from across the patch um, about the very important business of what we should be uh, seeing and prioritising in that strategy. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. David, you want to come in again? Just, just finally, you know, thank you for those responses and just assure the, the ICB that the, the network of 13 health watchers you know, are already willing and able you know, to support whatever you do um, in the interest of patients. We will 
we will do whatever we can to help you along your along your journey. We, I mean, we have had some discussion internally about the um, concept of the ICB and care board becoming known to the public. And <coughs> traditionally, uh, organisations at this level um, are really a, a sort of black box that the public doesn't either know about or, or need to know much about. But we would like to think that we do have an interface with the public directly, in addition to obviously what's done through the, the important place-based services. But Claire, I don't know whether you want to say anything about that. Yeah, I think I think it's it's clear, and it, we just need to look nationally at the public perception of the NHS. This is something that we need to 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 be cognizant of, but it's also something that we've got fantastic services across our our region, and and but we also know that we need to engage the public more in in some of the strategic intent um, of the Integrated Care Board and. Um, and I think all of which will could raise, raise our um, the confidence in our ability to deliver what we need to deliver across the health and care system. So I think that would be the right thing to do. Mike, just to put you on the spot a little bit, I mean, there's a lot of huge amount of um, interest at the moment about primary care and um, views being expressed that um, the public aren't... Uh, don't feel that they have the access they need, and yet primary care has been under a huge amount of pressure. <coughs> I've just wondered, and, and we've had a, a national report recently uh, by Dr. Claire Fuller suggesting a new way that primary care might be developed, and we know that it's played such an important part in each of the places that we've been working with over the last year to set up the ICB, but I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the the public and patient involvement in relation to primary care services. Thanks, Liam. Um, thank you for putting me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> but, um, actually, it's 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 an opportune question. I think in, I, was, I was discussing with David um, over lunch about the fact that I think it's really important that we bring patients into that conversation to explain the problem, but also try and come up with solutions. And I'm really pleased to see co-production mentioned so, so prominently in this bit of work. There's a bit of work that we're working on with the AHSN to look at ways to incorporate e-consultations, which are an electronic way of engaging with general practice in a co-produced way, and trying to figure out the best way to deliver co-production in, in the NHS. And I think that, that, that uh, yes, I would agree that this is an opportune moment to try and work with, work with patients and patient group representatives. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any other comments on this item? Yes, please, Neil. Practice has um, patient representative groups that meet very regularly, either in person or virtually. I think one one smart thing we could do um, as an ICB is to try and capture some of that, ensure that the lines of communication from uh, frontline primary medical services can find that um, any issues can find their way to the board, and that's something that we can certainly work on and harness that really important group. And I know they are linked in with Health Watch as well. Yeah. I mean, I've done quite a bit of... Yeah, sorry, Tom, go ahead. Well, um, I was just going to add to that, really, just in terms of our role in remaining vigilant to who we're engaging with and how we're engaging with people as well so that views are representative of our communities. Because I think there is a big risk that uh, we speak to those who are able to speak back to us, and, and that becomes um, an exacerbation of inequalities. Ken's Trust, for example, is doing some fantastic work around health literacy, trying to understand how we reach out to communities that have lower levels of literacy um, than, than others because fundamentally they can't engage if we communicate with them the way that we've always done. So I guess it, it links back to this strategy and just making sure that we are always checking in that we've managed to get to representative populations rather than just speaking to lots of people because actually yeah. we might be speaking to the wrong people. And, and I think there's a real opportunity as part of the framework to spread and share best practice. And, and I know of the work that's being done around health li literacy and there's other pockets of work, lived experience and making sure how do we weld that, that as a model within the work streams as they are developing or, or their plans or as things evolve. So there's, there's some great opportunities um, and there's certainly lots to do, but I think we've got a really good... Um, uh, baseline to, to, to build on. Sam? 
co-chair, I, I just wanted to make the point around what may for some be um, a subtle change in language, but it's quite an important one, I think, particularly from an NHS perspective, where the paper and the strategy talks about citizens as well as patients. And I think one of the, and it, it very much picks up the point you were, I think, making as well, Tom, about we need to make sure that we are listening and engaging with all parts of our communities. And while some people will be very active in terms of healthcare or, be, or have lived experience or be under health services, the vast majority of our communities won't be. Um, they won't be in active treatment. They won't um, necessarily have a long-term condition or chronic comorbidities, but their voice is absolutely equally important in terms, in terms of shaping health and care as citizens in our communities. So I really just wanted to kind of draw our attention to that point, which I think is quite a significant step change in some of these strategies that perhaps be more traditional from an NHS perspective. Thank you. Rajesh, you... Um, in the mental health field, this is a big part of m uh, modern delivery of mental health services, but complex. Uh, any thoughts on your experience and, and, it, and is there more work to be done there to try and um, expand this um, involvement <coughs> of patients and families? Well, I think the, the, the first thing to say is that we are for the maybe in my sort of professional career over the last uh, 25 years or so in mental health, uh, we've never been at a better place to really engage people who can drive their care. And partly, I mean, integration has been talked about, but partly there's been a number of national sort of policies. So I'll give you one example. You've talked about the Fuller Report, which is looking at integrated primary care. But we've also got uh, drives towards integrated community transformation. Mm -hmm. And I think that particular forum, which actually brings communities together to look at mental well-being and driving mental health care, which we can't do effectively unless we have people with lived experiences, communities, the voluntary sector, mm -hmm. uh, and all those who sometimes don't have a voice, especially those with addictions <coughs> and uh, other conditions. So I think we've got the building blocks. The biggest challenge now is to use this opportunity to draw on some of uh, uh, those opportunities we have to see how we can tease that out to make a significant impact. But I think we've got some good building blocks. Thank you. John Rush. I just wanted to say in, t in terms of the resources that we have available to do engagements or co-production, um, don't underestimate what you do need or what we do need. Um, and one of the things I would be really keen to, to sort of explore is between local authorities and the health service, how do we coalesce the resources that are available in terms of community engagement on an ongoing basis? Because they do exist. Um, and I think sometimes they're done a little bit separately. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, is not to be frightened of early engagement with communities about any kind of change policies. In the past, I think we have been a little bit frightened from an NHS perspective and come up with options that suited what we thought rather than kind of listening, first of all, to communities and what they think we, we could do. And the earlier engagement and the actual mechanisms that they can see and feel it is you end up improving the trust and confidence of communities. And I think the trust and confidence of our communities is going to be one of the biggest things that we need to do because they will... Communities will change as long as they understand what's happening and the reasons why. But I think that that element can only be done by a lot of hard work and relevant resources being put in place to do it. Okay, just before you sit down, John, um, the, there's been a, a lot of comment in the background to the um, establishment of the ICB that um, it needs to fit the different context of healthcare in in a region as large as this and obviously um, one of the one of the contrasts is between um, health and care in an, and even health population health in an urban environment and in a rural or semi-rural and par excellence Cumbria is um, in that category of rural and semi-rural uh, Northumberland many other parts of the integrated care system geographical area as well is there, um, and when we think about pu public and patient involvement and engaging with communities, 
do have you in your experience have they got concerns about um, access to care and consistency of care but maybe you could say a few words about that uh, definitely and both of them and, and again I suppose I, I have come from the North Cumbria region and I live in North Cumbria I'm sure the same will be echoed across some of the other rural areas that we have but the big the biggest issues are around how far is it to travel um, and particularly around things that are create potentially emergencies such as uh, maternity uh, and where those locations are and I know we spent a lot of time working out where we could provide relevant services in a geographically isolated area and it's it's very very contentious uh, but very very important but I'll go back to the point I said before if we have an en ongoing engagement through whichever forum it is you, we can introduce the fact that some of these changes are about to be made or we are considering them and then it doesn't come as a surprise um, and I can't underestimate how important that is but it's building the mechanisms and building the structures and I go back to the other point is we've got to do that with local authorities and we've got to do it with Health Watch as well in terms of that, that connectivity but it takes a lot of work and it takes people who step forward into a space who are able to do that and create that personal and I'm talking really personal connections with people because it matters. Thanks, John. Eileen. Really, to add to this point about how do we understand lived experience and how do we reach out to all our communities, uh, we have another community, and that's the community of people working in, in our universities and in our higher education organisations that have got a workforce that's um, skilled in uh, understanding how we can reach out to people, how we can collect their views, how we can think about their priorities. So we have um, 19 National Institute for Health and Care um, Research infrastructures, organisations that are about evidence and about all of those infrastructures have uh, a commitment and resources for public involvement and community engagement. And we've been doing this work and uh, the applied research collaboration itself, working with all six universities, we've got people who understand um, where our communities are, what their views are, what their lived experience is, and what their concerns might be about not only health but also well-being, and how to promote that for themselves and for their families. So in this spirit of partnership, there is a community that is also around us that is really, really wanting to step forward and be part of this conversation. Okay, thank you. Mike, is your flag up? It is. Yeah. So just to, to credit one, one element of the report, so page 21, I think one of the most important pieces and sentences in the entire report is, is setting the principle that and the expectation that all business cases that come to this board will have evidence of involvement and engagement in both the preparation and implementation stages. And bearing in mind that I think a lot of the work that will be done in the region will be done below the level of this board, I think it's really positive that we're setting the tone in that, in that way. I don't think the, I think for practical reasons it may not be possible at every level, but it definitely sets the expectation that where it is possible it should be done. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you. It's, it's very just get yourself a little bit closer to the microphone if you wouldn't Sir? mind, David, just for okay. the people online. Certainly, um, it's very reassuring to hear so many positive comments made about engagement uh, and involvement right across the board. Uh, that's great, but might there be a case? For, from this board to set its, its example with the staff within the ICB? Because I'm sure within the ICB, the ICS, the ICP's place, or wherever, there are pockets of very, very good practice, particularly in terms of early engagement, which is critical. But perhaps there, there might be some areas within the, the organization, vast as it is, where the message hasn't quite got through yet. So I'm just suggesting that the example which has been set very clearly by this board is somehow transmitted and the importance of it you know, across the staff throughout the, the organisation. Difficult to do, but I think it's important that we, yeah, we would seek to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll ask Claire at the end of the discussion just to come back, but I think the very important <coughs> big point made here about the, uh, that the connection isn't just with individual patients or patient groups and families but with communities and neighborhoods as well um, which I'm sure we but um, Ken you want to come in uh, two comments I made one um, this kind of whole concept of personalization of our public services has got to run through I think everything that we we do we've got a unique opportunity here the way we're structured 
regionally, but in some of our localities as well, to make sure that glue is lots of glue better together. And the second comment I make is don't also underestimate the impact of some of our foundation trusts that are well integrated into our communities. We have things like our Council of Governors and members, yeah. and some of our organisations have reach, quite a substantial reach into our population. And I don't think we actually make enough of that as FTs. And I think if we can harness some of that, that will also help directly cement some of this agenda together. Yeah, okay. Well, Ken, you're chair of the provider collaborative, so we look forward to working very closely with you on this. Thank you. Um, Claire, no, but I think we haven't got any other comments. Uh, Annie, did you want to comment? Please do. And yeah. It's just in relation to David's point about our people, really, David. And we took an early opportunity with our workforce to ask them to shape the values of the new organization going forward. Um, I'm delighted that they have been selected, but, but two of those values deeply ingrained with, around engagement and volume. So the first of those was respect, um, our commitment to listen to our communities in a respectful way, um, to, to pay attention to representation in the way that, that Tom referenced there. And the other one was around compassion, a core value for the organization going forward. So I was really, really encouraged that faced with an opportunity to select a number of values that at least two of those will be deeply linked to the way that we engage and involve our communities going forward. Jackie. Uh, yeah, it sounds kind of, I was just trying to think through what, what's going to be different and, and how would we improve it. Um, and probably two things that come to mind. I think one is um, the issue about diversity and making sure that we, we talk to everybody and in particular thinking about the priority that we've got around inequality, so how do we kind of reach out and, and uh, think about some of the different groups. But also I was struck by some regional work that was, was undertaken post-COVID, particularly with young people and understanding their experiences. And actually when, when we talked to kind of you know children in school, mainstream school, they, they gave us one perspective but actually when we dug deeper and in particular looked at children with additional needs uh, and particularly children, they gave us a very different perspective. So it's very important to think about that diversity and make sure that, that we capture that. Um, and I think that, that the second thing that came to mind is, is really then, I think that, that a number of people have, have made the point that we have got lots of systems and, and I think John's right about how we join that up. But I think that, that perhaps what, what would make it better is to have a consistent narrative in a language that not only we collectively understand, but probably more important, people understand in terms of the general public. Okay, thank you. Eileen, do you want to come in again? And, and I'm being asked to make sure that everybody, I know the mics are not dispersed everywhere. If you could get, pull it close towards you and um, pretend you're at the Stadium of Light. Yeah. So the conversation so far has been really great because I think in principle we are all absolutely, you know, um, committed to this agenda. I think we need to get past principle and then into practice and what we're going to do. And I just really want to say we're not starting from scratch. So there has been an exercise called the multiverse where members, uh, uh, colleagues of mine have been out to 18 locations and spoken with 3,145 individuals across our region, asking them what's most important to them in terms of health and well-being. And we have a report from this multiverse work that the NIHR infrastructures have done that's already uh, to inform you about what members of our public think is most important to them in this whole arena. So I think we've got a lot of building blocks to, to work from already, and we're not just at the beginning. We're actually some way through this journey. But having everybody aligned in terms of their commitment to the agenda is hugely important. And I just want to add to what Jackie says. Sometimes we don't always hear the voices of children and young people. Uh, it's important to do that one. And one piece of work that we're taking forward at the moment is some work from children who've um, experience of autism. They've, uh, they've uh, designed their own piece of uh, research work about inclusive schools for children with uh, neurodiversity. And we're going to be supporting that over the next year. And we're um, funding five young peer researchers to help drive that work forward. Thank you. Um, I think that's a great example, although we're discussing a specific strategic area, a very important one, I think it's a great example of, of a point that quite a few people have been making over the period when we've been planning the new ICB, that in our universities we've got 
huge amounts of expertise and there's no map of it and so I think we need to uh, we need to identify um, across all of our areas of uh, service and care uh, where the experts are and, and often they will have done great work like that which we can immediately draw on and that's something that hasn't happened particularly before and, and I think the the integration of our work with the uh, some areas of the universities work and we've got some really great universities in the North East and North Cumbria and, and, and we can build on that. Thank you Eileen for that example. So Claire, uh, I think we've come to the end of interventions from board members. Would you like to say anything in conclusion? Just, I mean, it's it's really encouraging to have this conversation at our first board, actually, and, and hear the commitment that all partners have um, in this work. I think we're all excited by the opportunity, as Eileen says. We're not starting from a base of zero here. Um, and um, I think we really, our actions will speak louder than our words, and we have to focus on that and look forward to coming back to future boards to update everybody on where we are. Okay, well, thank you very much for some very, very helpful insights and um, experiences which, uh, as Claire said, we will, we will be coming back to you to, to talk about this again. Um, and we move on now to item five, and this is one for you, Sam. Thank you, Chair. So this isn't very much another procedural item in terms of setting up the ICB as a new organisation. The paper sets out 10 um, specialist roles, lead roles that are required, and also the, um, the, the role of the appointed board member. With the exception of the mental health lead, um, however, I'm delighted that we do have Dr. Rajesh Nadkarni from one of our two mental health and learning disability organisations, and, and being a forensic consultant psychiatrist brings that particular expertise to our board, which is a statutory requirement. Notwithstanding, um, there will be other colleagues around the table who do also have experience um, of mental health and learning disability services too. There are five further roles that are not, not captured in the paper that were a specific request of NHS England. Um, and Chair, what I would just like to do, given that they're not captured in the paper, is just read these out in full with the uh, title of the person who will undertake them. The first one is an executive lead for children and young people, and that will be our chief nurse, David Purdy, who will also hold that role for the North East and North Yorkshire region. David will also be the executive lead for children and young people with special education needs and disabilities and will also be the executive lead for safeguarding. And then just two final roles, an executive lead for learning disability and autism will be Mark Adams, one of our executive directors of PLACE, and the executive lead for Down syndrome will be Dr Neil O'Brien, our medical director for the ICB. So um, what I would ask, Chair, is that the board um, approve the appointment, uh, put names of the appointed board members for the specialist lead roles required. Is everybody happy to approve that? Thank you. Um, and then the next item is also yours, Sam. Um. Thank you, Chair. Um, so today as an integrated care board, we are meeting um, really against the backdrop of recovery from the COVID pandemic but also seeing a 40-year high in terms of cost of living. And we know that this is already having an impact on our communities and indeed our health and care workforce um, who are members of those communities too. And we're also seeing an increase, particularly in the number of families and children living in poverty. Having said that, um, from um, a North East, North Cumbria perspective, I do want to recognise the significant amount of work that has been undertaken over recent years, particularly on prevention, and that of Amanda Healy, who is our Director of Public Health in Durham, and Dr Guy Pilkington, a Newcastle GP, who have co-chaired our prevention board and have undertaken a number of prevention initiatives. And also um, the Chief Executive of one of our foundation trusts in North Tees, who has led um, a particular advisory group for health inequalities. I won't go through the paper in detail, Chair. However, what it does set out, though, is the very particular circumstances that we um, have here in the North East and North Cumbria, and particularly that of our communities. It is not... S Sam, sorry to interrupt your flow, and you must flow on, but you're on item <laughs> My nine. myself. You've jumped ahead. So we, we carry on with this item now? Yeah, we can. can we do yeah. that, Chair? Yeah. Is that OK? Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, so in terms um, of, of the health inequalities, we know that they are not where they need to be for our communities. Um, we know that life expectancy is still um, uh, below um, the average life expectancy when we look at that for England. We also know that if you live in a deprived community in the North East, North Cumbria, your outcomes are going to be far worse than if you're living in a deprived community in the South of England as well. Um, putting it quite simply, Chair, we have some significant work to do. And one of the founding aims of all integrated care boards, we're one of 42 in England, um, is to address health inequalities in our communities. And therefore, what this paper on health inequalities and sustainability, which also picks up the work underway, particularly around um, the carbon reduction um, requirement, is making a recommendation that we establish a particular group over the next few weeks that would examine the work on health inequalities um, right across the North East and North Cumbria um, and bring back some proposals, Chair, to this board in the autumn in terms of addressing the health inequalities and particularly um, really getting underneath the actions that we're going to be proposing that we take as an integrated care board. Thank you very much, Sam. Well, I know that this is a subject um, uh, very, all of us around the table feel very passionately about, and some of us, or some of you, are particular experts in this area. So we may be, it is a very preliminary look, taking stock of what has happened up to now and um, giving a, an outline of what might be done in the future, but there's a lot of uh, work to be done, I think, to put flesh on the bones and to get this right. But um, we'll start off with you. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Liam, and thanks, Sam. I'm a bit closer to the microphone, oh, if yeah, you wouldn't mind. It does mind. seem a little bit far away. Let me pull that a bit closer. Thanks. I just want to really welcome this report. I think it's, um, I think you're, you're dead right, Sam. There's been some excellent work that's taken place over the last few years uh, since we were required to come, come together as... Uh, as an integrated care system uh, and work on the on the old STPs, if you remember those, um, brought together a lot of work around health inequalities. And there's excellent work taking place right here, right now, in some of our place-based um, communities, really trying to get to the root cause of health inequalities rather than just health outcomes that that we see uh, in relation to health inequalities. So I think the timing's right for a stock take, um, and so we'd really support support this piece of work. Um, not least because, as you reference, health inequalities is one of the kind of founding aims of the ICB. And that was one of the things that's really kind of drawn my attention with this reform is that improving health outcomes is objective number one and reducing health inequalities is objective number two. So part of my reflection is how do we hold ourselves to account here at this board around those two key objectives? How do we make sure that health inequalities is something that we look at for every single agenda item we discuss, whether that happens to be finance, performance, whether it's about in, um, our patient and public involvement. How do we make sure that we're constantly looking at these issues through a health inequalities lens? It was actually something I was going to raise under the um, delivery report, except we've, we've gone slightly out of sync, but, but how do we, through our delivery report, look at health inequalities? So that we don't just look at inequalities in outcomes, we look at inequalities in service delivery and service access and service outcomes as well and i think that's something that i'd really like us to to think about it's a big challenge to look at it through data but it's not impossible it's arguably very possible and how do we how do we live by our principles i guess and demonstrate that through our leadership behaviors here at this board so just welcome the report welcome the stock take and and challenge us to think about how we make sure we're looking at everything through that health and equalities lens thank you very much tom neil so again, I, I also welcome, welcome the report, and we have started some work on looking at this already. There are some well-established ICS work streams looking at this, and um, uh, we're, we're starting from quite a strong uh, position. We've, it feels like we have all the tools necessary to make um, some real inroads into this, but I do believe that some of the connections 
um, that we uh, that need to be strong um, aren't there at the moment. But um, uh, you know the examples with uh, with our universities and harnessing all that experience. We've got fantastic partnership working at place. How do we connect that across um, a, a larger a larger area? So I think we've we've we have the bare bones of how we could pull all of this together, and what's the relationship between the um, uh, our work on health inequalities with our ICP arrangement. I think that needs to be worked through as well. So um, another partner to to um, to mention is is Nex um, uh, Northeast Commissioning Support. They've got um, fantastic data resource that we've been working on for a number of years in a structured program of population health management over the last mm -hmm. two years. And those tools are there. They are within GP practices, um, but it's just making that final step to actually utilize the power of the data that we have to start making a difference and make some inroads into the health inequalities so there's a real opportunity and i think it is it's that as you said at the beginning it's about strong partnerships um and then well, that'll hopefully make make a difference for people on the ground thank you eileen i know that you've already made uh, some very important comments about the um leadership role that you and this region has in the national uh, research in health inequality but would you could you possibly just give us uh, for those who are completely unfamiliar with it a little potted summary of what this has to offer um, if we are able to tap into some of the work that's being done um, what this has to offer to the ICB's work on health inequalities yeah thank you Liam um, I'll, I'll start with um, the the applied research collaboration that I direct links together the six universities in the North East and North Cumbria with all of our partners across the NHS, public health, social care, primary care and voluntary and community sector. We've actually got uh, 58 organisations that are part of our ARC with those universities. We were given national leadership in prevention and inequalities and just shy of £4 million to take forward work across region with other ARCs in other parts of England uh, under the area of health and care inequalities and also prevention uh, and looking at behavioural risk factors. Some of that work includes work around um, uh, health and care systems as anchor organisations, as a major employers in regions and what difference that can make in terms of providing good jobs for people in this part of the, of the population and what impact that might have. On, on their well-being. We have, as an ARC, and we're a relatively new structure, two years old, a little bit older than an ICB, but over two years we've taken our direct award from just short of 9 million to 14. We've appointed just around about 50 two- or four-year uh, fellows to generate evidence on practical questions that are um, of priorities for our partners in the health and care system, working in partnership, with practitioners and public members to take forward, um, generating evidence on some of these key areas of interest for us. But what we're also interested and focused on doing is mobilising evidence that we hold to try to help it bring uh, forward to, to support decision making. And also we stand there with our skills and methods to think about how do we evalu evaluate some of the decisions taken by a structure such as an ICB and its integrated care partnership uh, so that we know that the decisions we make and the changes that are enacted actually lead to the outcomes that we'd hope for for people and patients. With that arc, we prevention inequalities just transcends everything that we do. Uh, we have a lot of capacity and a lot of expertise in that area. There's been a lot of describing this problem, and now we need to really mo move forward and think about how do we actually generate um, solutions and interventions to address the problem. I look at Tom sitting next to me, because Tom's been involved with us since the get-go. He's very much involved in our area around health inequalities and marginalised communities, and I wonder whether that part of the arc might actually convene some meeting to maybe just bring together all the evidence that is at their fingertips, which is an un a deep <coughs> understanding of inequalities, not just here, but, sp but in detail here, and also some of the work we're taking forward on uh, tackling uh, inequity in our region. Thank you very much, Eileen. Anne, Anne Workman, you pull the microphone a bit closer, because that one on that side seems a bit wonky. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you uh, Liam, and thank you. I really welcome this uh, report very much. Um, what a fantastic opportunity we've got. 
uh, in terms of this and just going back to Neil's point around place and um, our local areas, some of the cracking work that we, we've undertaken, um, our public health teams, the voluntary sector, um, you know, the work we do together and um, the opportunity we're going to have in terms of place based is incredible, building on what we've got already. And we talked earlier about um, people who are seldom heard. It, it's more around people who are seldom listened to. Um, so it's getting that getting that message across as well. So I just think it's so exciting. But thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, John, mine's just a quick one about coordination and um, not duplicating things. Yeah. You'll be aware, uh, Liam, that obviously in Cumbria and Lancashire there was a health equity commission mm -hmm. uh, that was initiated by uh, by the local authorities and the health partners and as well it was uh, sort of drawn together by Sir Michael Marmot and it's just to say that whoever's doing this work for us needs to take cognizance of that work because obviously the local authority were people that were, were very interested in it so it's just to coordinate rather than ignore and I, I, I welcome as everybody does the work that we're talking about here. Are there any other comments anyone would like to make? Oh sorry Isaac. go ahead yes. Thank you. Um, Following on from Eileen's, uh, uh, where I'm really heartened to learn of all the fantastic work that's going on in, in the universities. And one of the things that I think would be really valuable for us as an ICB to work towards is we, we have ambitions to create a system which is constantly learning. And uh, what we want to do is actually possibly take the research elements of, of learning more quickly into practice. And how do we create systems within our ICB that enable us to, to take that you know, evidence that we're generating constantly from the great work that the ARC is doing into Im impactful you know, service changes out there in the community? Used to be called the knowing doing gap. It was a <laughs> snappy way of describing it. Syra, you have to pull your microphone a bit closer, I think. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. So I was just thinking in line of what we've been saying and tying it in with the previous discussion we had about um, people involvement and engagement. I think we can't look at health inequalities as just health inequalities. It has to be a seamless transition of what our citizens are telling us and that translating into how we will improve our health inequalities. So I think very much our previous discussion ties in and what, what, what we're discussing right now. Okay. Uh, uh, any other comments yes please David go ahead thank you um, a, ca a cautionary but still positive comment no one underestimates the importance of the of tackling the inequalities agenda but within Northumberland I think there will be four or five different organizations partners all tackling the inequality agenda and I think one of the key tasks uh, facing the board and everyone else is to coordinate the work which is being undertaken because time, capacity, personnel um, is not unlimited. And I think to avoid duplication in this area is absolutely critical. <coughs> Otherwise, many, many people could be working very, very hard towards the same end. And I think one, one aspect of life, work and health and care is to avoid duplication. And I think that is something we must be mindful of with the tremendous amount of work which is being undertaken to make sure that there is coordination. Difficult though that may be, I think it needs to be undertaken actually. <coughs> David. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I would wholeheartedly agree with that comment. Uh, the microphone, David. Pull it a bit closer. I would wholeheartedly agree with that comment in relation to this item, but also the engagement item. Mm -hmm. There's so much resource out there and so much capacity. We haven't got to try and do things again and duplicate because that will just cause problems and, frankly, waste time. So really, if we get on and do that coordination piece, I think that would add real value to the system. So I think okay. as a board, we should stand by that. OK, thank you. I don't see any other requests to speak. So, Sam, would you like to round this off? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. I mean, just to say thank you for everybody's comments on this. I think, Tom, your points around service delivery and outcomes are absolutely crucial, as well as challenging ourselves around our leadership behaviours. We have to be really clear about what our priorities are and therefore what the outcomes are and how we're measuring that and how we can um, track progress. 
I think the point about coordination absolutely gets to the heart of this paper and the reason why doing a stock take will be important for us. Having said that, um, the comments about place are absolutely crucial. The, the, the founding of this work is at place, and we have many examples of work happening at place, whether it's in Northumberland, as you described, David, the Health Equity Commission in Cumbria, of which we are contributing to, or the Poverty Commission, for example, on North Tyneside. There is lots of work underway. And it isn't the role of the Integrated Care Board to um, seek to coordinate, to control that work. But what we do need to be clear about here are the things that we are going to focus on what those priorities are and how we're going to measure what the um, the impact of those um, will be on, on our communities. So, Chair, um, take the broad support today um, to set up this group. We will certainly keep the board um, appraised of progress with this and look to um, bring the outcomes of this back to the board in the autumn. And what we won't be seeking to do is replicate any work that's underway, but also building on the expertise out there, and particularly um, the expertise that um, Professor Kainer described um, uh, that sits within our universities. Thank you very much indeed um, for that item and also for the for the interventions and discussion which are incredibly helpful to us um, can we now go back to where we were Sam before you jumped three items <laughs> and deal with it's, item six so I was so keen to get into the health and equality yes of course discussion. I understand the passion thank, <laughs> but, <laughs> thank, but thank bureaucracy you, is important too <laughs> So this item is about the appointment of the founder board member of the Integrated Care Partnership, which is indeed yourself, Sir Liam, um, the paper sets out. Um, as, as Sir Liam described at the beginning of our meeting, we have an Integrated Care Board and we also have an Integrated Care Partnership, um, which is made up of our constituent places, our 13 places um, across the North East and North Cumbria. Um, and we would certainly be expecting involvement from the chairs of our health, the health and wellbeing boards and each of the, um, uh, there are in fact 12 health and wellbeing boards across the 13 places because a couple of places collaborate together through that. Um, we do have to set out a founding member, so it is proposed that that is um, Sir Liam. Having said that, over the weeks ahead, we will be building the membership of the Integrated Care Partnership and the Integrated Care Partnership will absolutely have a core role um, in setting um, our strategy um, for the uh, next five years, um, which would seek to address inequalities, look to address the particular needs of our population, those wider social and economic determinants of health, and the aim really being to improve the overall health and well-being and preventing ill health and premature mortality. That real holistic view of what the public's needs are, our citizens' needs and our patients' needs are right across the North East and North Cumbria. So the paper um, not only um, puts a proposal forward um, to agree the founding member of being Salim, but it is a reminder of the role of the Integrated Care Partnership and indeed the Integrated Care Strategy that we will be developing over the months ahead. Thank you. And just to be clear, that this isn't a proposal that I chair both boards. It's just a, a, something that's necessary to be a, a convener of a discussion. And um, th there's a lot of flexibility in how the Integrated Care Partnership Board will operate. The preference at the moment for um, the, the health and local authority partners through the uh, joint management executive group that's helped to develop a lot of the work for the ICB, their preference is that we would have one large um, Integrated Care Partnership Board and four smaller ones, which would work on a more day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis, with the larger one uh, perhaps being too big to be sensitive to local needs uh, to be uh, the only uh, board. Um, obviously, some of the smaller integrated care systems around the country would only have one uh, integrated care partnership. But the thinking at the moment is that we should uh, we should distribute um, closer to local populations, elements of the integrated care partnership. That can change. It's all really open to discussion. Um, and um, we'll be doing that over the next uh, couple of months. Now, if, if any members of the board 
would like to be more directly uh, involved in um, any of the work or the thinking, just let us know and um, you, you'd be very welcome to participate. <coughs> Otherwise, is everybody happy with that proposal? Okay, thank you. Well, the next two items um, are uh, deal with the profile that we've inherited. As, as you know, um, we have not been accountable for uh, the performance of the, um, of the NHS in the, um, in the last year or two. Um, when the integrated care system came into force, it was um, not even a shadow organization. It was helping and facilitating partnership working. Uh, but in the course of that, of course, had a good understanding of the performance of the uh, of the system, particularly uh, and notably during the um, COVID pandemic, but the accountability was not in place. But it now is in place. So we want to let you uh, have an insight into the uh, performance profile and the financial profile that we have inherited and that we are all from now on accountable for. So if we could start off um, with um, item seven, um, which um, Jacqueline's going to take us through. Thank you, Chair. So uh, you have in your pack uh, an integrated delivery port, which runs to, I think, 37. Yeah, the microphone a bit closer, closer Jacqueline. So, which I think runs to 37 slides. And important though this report is, I don't propose to try and uh, do those 37 slides individual justice. Uh, rather, I'm just going to take you through a summary and then obviously there'll be opportunity to ask any questions. But before we start that, I just wanted to make a couple of remarks about the Integrated Delivery Report. Um, I'd like to thank the many CCG colleagues who've worked on pulling this report together for us so that we can uh, go through it this afternoon, uh, but in particular, Siobhan Brown and, and Claire Dobble. Um, and um, I'd just like to say three things, I think, about the report. Um, uh, obviously, as Liam has, has, has framed for us, it's an introduction to how things stand uh, across the uh, across the, IC, the, the ICS, rather, uh, as we take up uh, the reins uh, this afternoon. Um, but I think that uh, in future meetings, um, it will sit uh, in, in a kind of more uh, organised structure uh, of oversight, assurance, escalation and improvement support. So I would expect that in future that the, the detail that you see in the report here and in fact, more detail will have been scrutinized and discussed in our quality and our uh, finance and performance subcommittees and we'll have the benefit of chair reports and insight that's been gleaned in those meetings. The second thing I wanted to say was about um, the, 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 the place that the report will have in our kind of wider arrangements. So I would expect that we would hope to see a sort of golden thread from the strategy we set to the one year plan and the milestones that we wish to achieve over the year. Um, and, and use this report not just to give us an absolute measure of how we're performing against various national standards and asks, but also to see whether we're delivering, as expected, progress that we've set out in our plan for the year. Um, and so it would, it would kind of sit in that framework. And the third thing I wanted to say actually speaks to the remarks that uh, my colleague Tom made earlier, which is I think there is a, there's further work to do, and we've had some very positive discussions about this already, about how we make sure that the plan is giving us true insight and intelligence um, about the state of our services and how they're progressing. Uh, you mentioned, Tom, threading uh, health inequalities throughout the report. And indeed, I think you know, another lens is need, isn't it? Uh, just yesterday, I was having a conversation with colleagues about the urgent emergency care dashboard that's being developed and how we must be really thoughtful about the uh, measures that we're taking and the uh, inferences that we're drawing from that. So an example might be where we see uh, elevating levels of demand for urgent care, if that's not set in any kind of context in relation to the need in the population that those services are provided to, then we might uh, jump to some uh, erroneous conclusions. So uh, there's, there's plenty of work to do, I think, to continue to hone this report and make it uh, as useful as possible to us as board members in understanding uh, how our services are doing. So that's all I wanted to say, uh, Chair, by way of introduction. So now I'm just going to take us through a, a limited number of slides uh, and then obviously there'll be an opportunity to uh, ask any questions. Uh, so this first slide uh, just sets out um, uh, in terms of the uh, NHS and ICS priorities for 22-23 
um, that we ha we're not today providing you with a report against those priorities. They're set there in the bullet points, but we're aiming to bring that to you in the next meeting in September. Uh, this slide also notes uh, that the NHS uh, SOF system oversight framework was published uh, just four days ago, so we just received that. Um, and uh, uh, in the slide, uh, I've outlined the position in terms of our providers uh, and their uh, ratings in the current uh, system oversight framework measurements, which will be freshed uh, monthly as we go through the year. Um, I would say, uh, uh, on, uh, in relation to the SOF, that it is very much focused on our larger providers. But as we develop our oversight framework uh, for the ICB, we will obviously be looking at the provision of all services uh, in addition to our larger providers. OK, I'll just push on. Um, so this slide uh, just sets out uh, the current uh, soft segmentation uh, for the trust. There are four segments set out in the National System Oversight Framework uh, from one uh, through to four. Uh, we don't have any trust in segment four. Uh, trusts that are uh, seen as being in segment four are requiring the highest level of support um, and are subject to uh, national support and intervention. As you'll see from the slide, we have three trusts in segment one, we have five trusts in segment two, and then we have three trusts in segment three. Uh, in terms of the uh, ICB's oversight framework, that's something that is uh, currently in development and finalisation, and we'll be bringing that uh, back to a future meeting. Um, and we'll be working with our colleagues in NHS England around the implementation of that framework and how we support our organisations uh, who are subject to the system oversight framework uh, to improve their performance over time. Uh, this is a very busy slide. I hope you're able to uh, have the opportunity to have a look at it in your pack. And it's really here by way of example of the sorts of measurements uh, that we're starting to put together uh, in the field of, of health inequalities. Uh, I think we're all kind of uh, <laughs> try, trying to... Uh, I'm just going to draw out a couple of examples um, of what's in here. Uh, and I should have said earlier, and I would, I'd, I'd like to say throughout this, that we welcome feedback on the development of this report and whether board members find it helpful, uh, if there is anything different you'd like to see or more, uh, and we'll continue to develop it. But you'll see here, for example, we're looking at smoking prevalence in the, uh, in the middle uh, column. Um, and what we're looking at is over a period of uh, five years, whether uh, smoking prevalence, uh, and sorry, the gap in, whether smoking prevalence is getting uh, better or worse, and it's getting better in the, in the sense that it's lower. And you can also see that there's a slight reduction in the, in the, if you like, gap between the highest levels of smoking prevalence and the lowest in our various places. Uh, in the uh, circled area below, which is depression prevalence, unfortunately we're seeing uh, 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 not a good picture here in that we're seeing higher prevalence of depression uh, and a, a slight widening uh, of inequalities there in terms of the, the gap between the areas that are suffering the most uh, versus the least depression. Uh, this is in an early stage of development, uh, so it's really just shared with you uh, to give you an example of the sorts of things that we're starting to uh, measure. And in bold there at the bottom, to remind me to mention to you, there is a national strategy around tackling health inequalities, which is called the, it's got a very snappy title, the Core 20 uh, plus 5. And for the uninitiated, that's about looking at the 20% of our population who are suffering the worst uh, health inequalities and really focusing in on how we uh, support and deliver improvement for those uh, populations. In addition, the plus five are five areas of local focus that we uh, choose to identify for North East and North Cumbria and work on. So uh, more, I'm sure, on our health inequalities approach in, in future meetings. This is a real summary slide of some of the uh, quality uh, improvement work and quality oversight work that's going on in the system. Again, just to reference you back to the larger pack where you've got uh, more detail on the quality slides. Um, so just to draw out some, some key highlights or perhaps issues would be a better turn of phrase. We do know that we've got some significant workforce pressures across both primary and secondary care, uh, and that has given us some challenges. Uh, in particular, we've uh, seen some uh, repeated spikes in absence rates, which are relatively high for England, a lot of that driven by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as people be aware. Uh, we have seen uh, some uh, issues in terms of our staff survey uh, results that were published in uh, 20 to, uh, March 22, where uh, some trusts were below the national averages, um, and uh, all of those individual trusts have action plans uh, looking at how they tackle the, the issues that were raised in their um, staff surveys. Uh, but we do also have five trusts. Uh, so I've got that number. I think it's four. 
That's right. This is, so, so we've got four trusts below average for recommending the trust as a place where relatives should be cared for, and then five trusts as, in terms of recommending the trust as a place to work. So obviously some um, areas for, for action by our providers there. In the pack, there is a detailed slide on uh, the actions that have been identified for maternity services in the Ockenden Review, uh, and uh, you can see some details about the progress uh, that's been delivered by the individual providers there. Uh, this is just a slide drawing out some um, of the issues around primary care. These are slides uh, looking at uh, primary care activity levels. Uh, in the two uh, diagrams, you've got, uh, uh, first of all, on the left-hand side, uh, a trend rate in terms of uh, DNAs. That means do not attend, so patients failing to attend their appointment, which is obviously an area of concern given the pressure in primary care. Uh, the second slide looks at the uh, provision of face-to-face -face appointments, and in the um, bullet points you can see that in April 22, 67% of all appointments were delivered face-to-face -face, uh, across our region. Um, we've got a single data point in the narrative there just to give you a sense of scale of primary care in our patch, so 1.2 million appointments uh, delivered in primary care just during April 22, uh, and demand remains high. This is a slide looking at performance against the National um, Accident Emergency Standard that patients should be uh, seen and uh, either treated, uh, admitted and, or treated and then discharged or admitted within four hours. This is the May 22 performance. You can see there that we do have um, significant and uh, fairly enduring uh, reduction in uh, delivery against uh, the 95% target. For May, we delivered 78% against the 95% standard. Uh, in northeast and North Cumbria. Uh, the national performance was 73%, so uh, relatively speaking, we are uh, a strong uh, performer, but obviously this is an issue uh, which is causing concern, rightly so, nationally. Um, we also uh, have a diagram there showing you the increasing pressure around uh, trolley weights. So these are patients who um, are waiting to be admitted to a bed in any departments, and you can see uh, in 22, since Christmas, we've seen a real rise, and that reflects some of the significant pressures we've got uh, on our uh, bed capacity across the region. Um, again, this is not an outlier nationally, but that's not to say that we're not extremely concerned about it. And I know there's a lot of intensive work uh, going on in our places, looking at how providers can work together uh, to try and uh, improve flow through our hospital beds. Um, and indeed, uh, many schemes looking at uh, alternatives to admission. Uh, and you've got a little bit of narrative here on the slide about what's going on in our four ICP areas. I'm just conscious of time, so forgive me if I'm not getting into lots of detail. Uh, this is a slide looking at ambulance handovers and also ambulance response times during the month of May. Again, this is just a flavor of the sorts of things that we're measuring. Um, uh, so you've got data here for both uh, NWAS and for NIAS. Um, overall, um, as, a, as a patch, we are doing well on the C1 standard. That's the uh, most urgent ambulance uh, response standard of seven minutes, um, but less well on some of the uh, uh, category two, three, and four. Uh, there's a little bit of detail here about some of the work that's going on to address that. For example, the recruitment of additional paramedics, clinical care assistants, and so on. And this is something that we're working very tensely on uh, both uh, with our ambulance providers in terms of the uh, response times and handovers, but also with the wider system, as clearly these are uh, issues that need uh, multi-partner action to address. This is a slide on performance exceptions relating to RTT. Apologies for the acronym for the uninitiated. This is the 18-week referral to treatment standard that's been in place for, for many years as part of the NHS constitution. For context, um, I think uh, most board members will know that in more recent times, unfortunately, we've been in the uh, arena of measuring 52-week, uh, 78-week, and 104-week waiters on a journey back to uh, trying to get closer to uh, the original target of 18 weeks. So this year, in the operating plan guidance, uh, we were set targets in relation to those waiting times. Uh, and these slides uh, show you uh, progress against those. So first of all, to draw out the good news, waiting times are falling across uh, our region, which is good to see. Uh, nationally, the ask was that there would be no patients waiting 104 weeks, which is two years and a very long time to wait by the end of uh, June, so yesterday. Uh, we have been aware for some months that whilst progress overall has been excellent, 
There are some, a small cohort of patients, uh, mainly those requiring complex spinal operations, who we didn't have a solution for uh, by the end of June. This is a national problem, and we are working uh, with the national network and with the NHS England to, to find uh, solutions for those patients, including offering them the opportunity to tra travel elsewhere for treatment. So we're still working through that. Um, in the slide, you've got a little bit of detail about where we are uh, in terms of uh, delivering the 78 uh, uh, note. So, so just to be clear, the target is uh, to reduce 78 week waiters to zero uh, by the end of March um, and uh, the progress against that and to see a reduction, which we were able to define locally, in the people waiting over a year. Uh, we have been seeing reductions just in recent weeks. We've seen that start to move up a bit. Uh, we, it's not totally unexpected in that it's the kind of one year anniversary of referrals really um, recovering uh, following the contraction of referrals into secondary care during the pandemic. So more patients were referred a year ago and so we're seeing many more patients cross the line into the one year wait uh, just now. But the providers have got plans in place uh, to deliver a set of trajectories and we're still um, aiming to deliver those by uh, the end of March. This is an section report uh, relating to the cancer standards. Uh, so uh, a few different uh, standards covered here. Uh, and again, some really good news in terms of the faster diagnosis standard. That standard aims to see that 75% uh, of patients get their diagnosis within 28 days of referral. Locally, our Cancer Alliance has set a stretch target of 80% and currently uh, we're delivering 76% uh, across uh, the region, which is really great to see. Where we've got uh, more of a challenge is in uh, on what we call the 62-day pathway, which is another referral to treatment target. So 62 days from referral to treatment or diagnosis and discharge. Uh, and we have uh, a backlog of patients uh, who have gone beyond 62 days and unfortunately have not yet had either their diagnosis or uh, if, if they've got a diagnosis of cancer, their treatment. Uh, we have recovery plans in place to try and um, make sure that this is recovered during year, but at the moment uh, we are unfortunately not uh, in a position to uh, be clear that we can deliver the national ASP by the end of the year. Uh, some really good work going on in that uh, area. For example, one of the uh, greatest areas of pressure is in the lower gastrointestinal pathway, and we've formed an endoscopy network to look at how the trust can work together to speed up the diagnosis of the patients on that pathway. Uh, this is, a, again, apologies, a very busy slide, just looking at some of the excepts, uh, exception reports around mental health and uh, learning disabilities and autism. Um, there's a large number of targets referred to here in the slides. Um, what we're seeing um, in, in real summary in relation to a uh, number of targets is here, uh, most of these targets relate to increasing uh, the number of patient contacts and treatments uh, uh, in order to meet demand. And although we have plans and we are seeing increased capacity and increased numbers of uh, treatments and assessments taking place, uh, we haven't yet got plans that get us to the level of uh, activity uh, that, that's set out in the National ASS. So through the national programme, we've been set a set of numeric targets in terms of the volumes of assessments and treatments that, that we deliver in each of these areas. And I'll say a little bit more about that when we, we look at the plan slides. Uh, so, so a number of exceptions here and, and quite a lot of work to do uh, you know, uh, with and, and across the sector to see what more we can do to, to develop uh, capacity and, and workforce is, is one of a number of uh, pressures in this area. Okay, so that is the whistle-stop tour of the uh, very detailed uh, performance and delivery report before you. Uh, happy to take any questions, Chair. Okay. I'd like to suggest um, we've been running for a, an hour and a half now that we have a 20-minute break, and then we'll come back and have discussion on, sure. on uh, Jacqueline's presentation and also then move on to the, the finance presentation. Everybody okay. happy about that? Okay. Sure. okay, then, so we're five past two, so we'll, f we'll come back at 25 past. Thank you. That's good.
Jacqueline's presentation. Um, Mark, you were first. You, in fact, you had yours to hand up before t the tea break, so go ahead. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, it was just to say it's really welcome to see this report at our first meeting, um, and I know it's work in progress, but um, absolutely uh, congratulations to Jacqueline, Siobhan, uh, Claire, and colleagues to get it to this point. Um, it was just to make the point, though, that we, are, we have a lot of representation of different organisations and, and groups around the table. Um, and I know that the report is work in progress, but I also think there's a real opportunity as time goes on for us to think about other data sets, um, other sets of information that allow us to add um, richness and, and colour to the report as we go on. Um, and I'm also thinking particularly here in terms of the conversation that we had earlier in the meeting about the voice of citizens um, and the opportunity that we've got through the strategy that we spoke about earlier on in the meeting to be able to get more of that information from the voice of the citizens into the report about um, context, but also things that are going well, but also helping us to identify issues of concern going forward as well. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Neil. Yes, thanks. I just wanted to make um, a couple of points. First is uh, regarding the primary care data. I think it's worth recognising that the amount of activity through the pandemic um, and, and, uh, and indeed um, to date, and the, the amount of face-to-face -face consultations that have continued throughout the pandemic with all the negative press that was around there at the time is probably worth recognition. And I think also um, that we need to also recognise that primary care have delivered 70% of the millions of vaccinations that have gone on um, over the last uh, few, uh, uh, few months. Um, the, the other thing to, to, to also recognise is that anyone, there's some challenging aspects of performance in here, I think that's, that's fair to say, and no one who works in the NHS will be happy with, with this. But I think it's just to recognise our people and where they are. I think we've, the, the staff have had an exhausting two to three years, um, and supporting our staff to make the changes to the performance is something that we should really um, look to, to focus on. And COVID has not gone away. Um, I was on a call this morning, staff absences are increasing, and the number of COVID cases are also increasing. So as we, as we look to um, improve the performance of our NHS services, it just needs to be on that, back, on that backdrop. So I just thought they were important points to make. Okay, thank you. Jackie. Um, again, a couple of points. I mean, Mark Storm Come a bit closer, please, Jackie, to the microphone. Sorry, is that better? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so Mark's stolen a bit of my thunder, but, but probably uh, I think that in terms of, of th this report, it, it's really comprehensive and it, it's really useful in terms of giving particularly an NHS perspective. And I think that, that for me, kind of moving forward, there's something about kind of how we look at the social care data, because equally there are some system issues that we need to understand in, in the context of, of the NHS data. Um, and I think that the second point is then probably just in terms of then how we interpret all of the data and the analysis that sits behind it. And again, I would urge that we try to look at that from not only just an NHS lens, but a care lens as well. So we really understand what the data is saying, the impact, and we have kind of, a, again, a joint consistent narrative around that. Thank you very much. Mike. Uh, just to echo the points that this is an excellent report and an excellent start, I think, given the, given the challenges um, of pulling it together from lots of different organisations. Just a few few points to raise. Firstly, echoing Tom's point made earlier regarding inequalities, it's great to see within the outcomes section the inequalities highlighted over the years and what, whether the gaps are getting bigger or smaller. Um, but within other areas of the report, there isn't a lot of reference to inequalities specifically, so I think there's definitely an opportunity there to, to focus more on that. Um, the other thing that I noticed, uh, and, and something I think we should be maybe paying as much attention to or more attention to, is the patient and staff experience uh, indicators. There are some of those in for the different foundation trusts, and there's quite a tight correlation between the trusts that need additional support and those where, for example, staff are saying that they're having a good experience or that they would recommend those those places for care. Those Some of those soft indicators are a really good canary in the coal mine, so to speak, about what's going right and what's not going so well. And, and finally, just to point around the choice of indicators, um, I think the choice of indicators is really important because that'll dictate what strategies emerge from this, from this data. And I think that's where we need to be bringing in patient perspectives and citizen perspectives wherever possible to try and make sure that we're choosing the things that matter to people. Thank you very much, Mike. Sam. 
Thank you, Chad. Um, just three quick comments. Um, elective recovery and recovery of waiting times for elective procedures in hospitals. I do want to acknowledge and thank our colleagues in our NHS Foundation Trust, particularly for the collaboration that they um, have shown in um, really wanting to drive down those waiting times and offer people across our communities the opportunity to have their elective procedure um, in um, one of the those hospital-based services. And I would really, really commend that collaboration and to also say that we would really like to see more of that as well, particularly um, in ensuring that we are offering that choice to our patients, but also we're reducing um, the waiting times. The, the second thing is I was really struck by um, the depression prevalence. And I was looking at the slide and seeing um, actually we've got an onward downward trend in terms of performance against that. Um, however, within our 13 places, the best performing area, Newcastle and Gateshead, the um, uh, least performing area, North Cumbria, two different populations, rural, urban. And I think that's a good example of things we need to explore uh, and look at, look at in more detail. And then just finally, I really again want to commend our primary care colleagues. 67% um, of all appointments seen face-to-face, 67% um, during that period, but also against a backdrop of 5% um, of all appointments being uh, people who have not attended as well. So we do know that one of the pieces of feedback we are getting, and this is very much national, that more people do want to see their GPs um, or their primary care practitioners face to face. Um, but it was it was good to note there that 67% of all appointments have been face to face over the last month. Okay, thank you. Go. Come in again, Mike. Just to follow that from a primary care perspective, I would say that G GPs, for the most part, also want to see their patients face-to-face. -face. It's a two-way street. It makes it much nicer seeing a person face-to-face. -face. Um, just a point on the DNAs within general practice as well. There seems to be quite a tight correlation between the face-to-face -face appointments and the DNAs occurring, which is not entirely surprising. Um, and I suspect those two data points are correlated because of the way that IT systems work, so that there may be a, need to be a little bit of scrutiny of that as to how reliable the DNA data is. Okay, thank you. Um, no other comments? Oh, so, yes, sorry, yes, go, go, go. yes, go ahead. Thanks, Ian. Just, just, um, just what, when we were talking about DNAs, I think uh, the, the points referenced earlier about health inequality, I think DNA is probably a perfect example of what I'm talking about. If we were to look at DNA rates by deprivation quintile, for example, we would see wide variation. I could I bet uh, John's £6.5 billion pounds that, that we would see that uh, that gradient um, within the DNA rate. So it's an example of where we would we see intervention-driven inequalities, and that would be really key to include in the, in the performance report moving forward. So I'm really keen to work with you on that, Jacqueline, if that's OK. And then the other thing was just about workforce. Workforce is such um, an important challenge that we're facing at this point in time. And I know it's referenced in the report, but I don't know whether we whether there are any kind of system-wide measures or indeed measures at, at, at different places that, that start to illustrate that and something that we might want to consider including within a performance report, just given the, the significant challenges we seem to be facing across all, all workforce sectors at this point in time. Can I just uh, perhaps pick up with you and Neil the, the I saw on the news last night a health foundation, which one of our uh, think tanks, of course, uh, forecasting quite a big shortfall in in general practitioners over the next five to six years. Um, is that going to play out differently in different parts of the country, or is it likely to be an across-the-board change, do you think? Uh, uh, the, 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 the figures that I've seen about general practitioners per thousand population, actually the northeast. Um, uh, performs pretty well nationally on that. Um, that being said, we do have, looking at the profile of the workforce, we do have quite a number um, who are nearing retirement age and quite a number of people who are actually retiring earlier because of the pressures of the job. <coughs> that being said, we are um, uh, there are quite a lot of doctors in training um, within this area. The new Sunderland Medical School as well will bring on a lot more doctors within this patch and the, the training is actually more tailored towards a career in general practice. So we do have some initiatives that might help mitigate some of that but undoubtedly it will be a pressure. 
um, and um, we need to work with our partners in Health Education England um, just to make <coughs> to, to try and do the very difficult task of workforce planning in this group. It is quite difficult to do. Um, also, a lot of GPs now um, uh, are looking at more portfolio careers and don't go full time into general practice. But um, uh, what we can demonstrate in this area that. Um, our practices in the North East and North Cumbria have been innovative in the workforce that they have within practices, so using um, uh, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, and the um, extended roles um, scheme for PCNs has particularly helped with that. So um, in short, yes, there will be um, pressures. I think we're in a good place in the North East and North Cumbria, but it is something that needs to be carefully watched. And also, again, going back to the health inequalities, although the overall number of GPs per thousand registered population is quite <coughs> favourable, there are pockets within the North East and North Cumbria which are usually more deprived areas that doctors, if they can choose where they work, don't tend to choose to work there for lots of different reasons. And that's something, again, we can look at as an ICB about how do we encourage um, doctors to work in our um, more deprived communities and under-doctored areas. <coughs> Mike. I, I, Neil stole my comments. I, would, I was particularly going to emphasise the fact that the, the medical schools in the North East um, are very tailored towards community practice and general practice in particular and have far more general practitioners come out of their training than other universities in the country. And training people locally tends to encourage them to stay local to the northeast. Myself being an example, but I have many friends from medical school who are GPs in the northeast now. So I think em embracing the opportunity with Sunderland Medical School in particular is, is, is one opportunity area, albeit it's not going to pay dividends for a long time. Okay, thank you. Right, anybody? Oh, Annie, yes, please. Yeah, it was just in relation to Tom's query about workforce. <coughs> um, so certainly the evidence would suggest there are a number of key metrics that we could look at. Michael West's research reminding us that staff engagement as a measure, the number one predictor of organisational outcomes. Um, so something that we could um, certainly track and have an ambition. And I think it's recognising as an organisation we would want to have a much greater ambition than an annual staff survey in mm. terms of understanding the emotions of our staff and have already taken early steps in a, in a period of transition to understand where um, our own colleagues were feeling across all CCGs and in partner organisations like, like NEX. Um, and with fantastic engagement, we have an opportunity to look at that data from the perspective of groups represented by protected characteristics and really understand variation in our workforce and, and what our, that means. And, and that provides the opportunity to work in partnership with universities around um, the use of technology and how we engage people in different ways and exciting ways for the future. So all things that we would hold very dear, not only for in the development of a new organization, but also what we'd want to see across the system in terms of workforce and metrics relating to that. Thank you. Sarah, did you come in? Thank you, Chair. It was just to say that Sunderland has the sixth younger, youngest GP workforce um, in the country, and that obviously if there are lessons to be learned and shared, I think we may now have the mechanisms to do that, and I think it would be worthwhile to help understand our regional needs better and how we can um, improve underdocted areas throughout our region. Thank you very much. Yes, Eileen. It was really to follow up about workforce. Can you hear that? Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, apart from training, we need to retain people and we need to make good jobs for our practitioners. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do at the moment, particularly through the Applied Research Collaboration, is to provide opportunities for um, practitioners to take some uh, funded time uh, out of the of practice to develop their <coughs> ideas around questions that they want to, to, to generate or qualifications that they'd like to achieve. It was, been, it was a very super subscribed um, opportunity. We've just onboarded 16 uh, practitioners who will take between one day and two and a half days fully paid, so they're backfilled, to be able to pursue qualifications or work with colleagues in universities to drive questions from their practice that they want to answer. So, and, and we are hearing that this is an element 
of attractiveness in a job, to have that space for time and thought to generate evidence around your practice and to build new skills, to become more evidence-informed practitioners? I mean, sticking with the medical workforce, uh, looking back on my longish career, I've, it's been very noticeable the way that um, d doctors who are starting on their training split between hospital uh, practice and general practice. So certainly when I qualified, everybody wanted to go into hospital practice and no one into general practice. And then subsequently there was a big swing towards general practice. Um, and particularly in Northumbria where people like Donald Irwin, there were, there were, a, lo there were a lot of leaders who set up very good vocational training schemes and ever and then there was another swing back in the 1990s towards hospital medicine so that's a that's part of the equation that isn't perhaps talked about as much that you've got a cohort of medical graduates which way do they go and and there are all sorts of factors that influence that to do with um, perceptions of what life is like so if you know get, getting too much much gloom and doom about um, pressures, it has an immediate impact on then people's choice of career, plus the fact that having been involved in workforce planning in the past with the hospital specialties, it's almost impossible to determine the number of people that you will need in a particular specialty. There are 53 specialties of medicine in 10 years' time, which is the length of time it takes to train and you know, whole specialties sometimes wiped out by interventional techniques that mean that you don't need surgery for that anymore. So it's a very, very difficult um, area, and, and it will be. And you've got postgraduate deans and people of that um, involvement as well. Yeah. OK, so um, Jack. Where I can't see the flag. Oh, yes, 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 Claire. Some of them look like water glasses, those flags. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Sorry, Chairman. Um, it's just to pick up the point regarding recruitment, and it's a reminder that we have worked in collaboration with uh, Health Education Northeast for some years regarding the NHS Find Your Place campaign, which really focuses on attracting junior doctors into the region into specialty positions and including into GP training positions. And there's probably more we can do to revitalise that and, and to, to, to really look at how we target um, target that further to to get the junior doctors into the into the area, but also looking to see how we use that model um, to underpin some of the recruitment effort to get more GPs into the area too, because we we can cleverly use some of the algorithms available to us via social media to be able to be quite targeted in that. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Rajesh. Thanks, Chair. Oops. Can you hear me? Uh, go a little bit closer, and that's good. Thank you. Um, just to, two quick comments. I mean, the first thing, um, just your reflection about how things change uh, with the example you gave with hospital doctors coming in and that in general practice. Currently, the trend we are having is that uh, if you look at the fill rates, post-medical school for psychiatry, we're having 100% fill rates. Mm. So clearly there's something happening where young people are very, very interested in mental health. But it will take a few years for that to kind of translate into kind of more specialist jobs. But the other point I wanted to make was, uh, if you look at the mental health work stream of the ICS, the workforce group there has adopted a strategy. Clearly retention is absolutely important, making jobs which are doable, but more importantly, also having the time to learn and think, uh, because you know people have just lost the ability to do that because of what's happened over the last two years. But the work stream has looked at three areas. One is how can we support traditional roles with some new roles, and we talk about clinical assistance and so on. And then also how can we look at new roles which are outside of the traditional roles, people with lived experiences and so on and so forth and then look at how can all that be linked together along with the retention aspects. So I'm just wondering, Annie, as we look at examples, I mean, there are great examples all over our region of what people are doing, foundation trusts, local authorities, VCSCs, and so on. But it might be useful to get that approach and see whether we might want to make a statement as an ICB around this 
and to see where we can add value to what is already going at many of the places or at trust levels. Yeah. I mean, you could certainly make rapid changes on recruitment. Um, I was talking to the chief executive of um, South Tees Foundation Trust, James Cook Foundation Trust, and um, they, have, they were in the doldrums as far as covering quite a few key specialties. They just couldn't recruit people, even locums are having difficulties, and apparently they have relatively recently appointed 90 uh, new consultants. So you can, you can do it. it. And I asked why, how have you done it? And it did sound a bit vague, but basically it was to do with making the culture and the and the mood and the the feeling of of development and change, uh, giving that a very high profile, and it, it sort of worked its way through, and people wanted to come. So I think. Um, that's often a good feature of the Northeast anyway in Cumbria, but it's something that I think we can build on. Yes, please, Graham. Thank you, Chairman. It's really just a, a plea, because obviously we've got major <coughs> pressures on clinical and allied health professional staff, but as we become increasingly dependent on technology, there's a, a, a risk and a challenge going forward how we uh, attract and retain people in digital uh, careers and data science careers. So again, those metrics apply to a whole range of our workforce colleagues that you know, we want to make the North East and North Cumbria the best place in the country to work in a whole range of, of disciplines and specialities. Thanks, Thank Graham. You. Jackie, did you want to come in? Uh, I, yes. uh, I yeah. think, um, I suppose, some of the, the, the kind of things that people have put forward particularly around clinicians and GPs and, and nursing is, is really really important and I think we, we've had those issues for a number of years. Um, I think that, that probably what feels really acute from a local authority perspective at the moment is, is particularly at the other end of the spectrum and thinking about carers but also kind of home care and, and nursing homes where there are big recruitment issues and, and basically nobody's stepping forward to kind of undertake some of that, that work. Um, so again, kind of perhaps working with Jackie to try and just understand exactly the size of, of that issue, but also the impact, because clearly if that's not there, then that has implications across the whole of the system. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other interventions, so Jacqueline, uh, you don't have to respond to every point, but just to, some general points you want to make. Thank you, Chair. I won't attempt to uh, respond to every point, but it's a really rich and, and useful uh, introductory discussion to what is a, a critical but complex thing to get right, isn't it? How do we measure whether we're delivering uh, the outcomes that we aim to deliver for our patients, and how do we measure all of those key enabling processes that move us towards the outcomes we eventually want to achieve? So. Uh, ju just a couple of things, if I may. Um, it's very much my intention to set up uh, a working group, a steering group, to get this report right uh, as quickly as we can, but also to recognise that it will be iterated and developed over time. And also just wanted to draw out the obvious key link between developing our strategy and then reflecting uh, a set of measures that relate directly to the priorities and objectives we set ourselves uh, as a board and as a community as a result of that. Um, strategy, but I think in parallel to that strategy development work, which will go on for the uh, the months through to uh, the end of the year, uh, some of the areas that have already been highlighted today. Uh, the, this isn't an exhaustive list, but around health inequalities, around workforce, and around the wider uh, health and care sector, we can concurrently be developing uh, data uh, streams uh, and intelligence and insight in those areas because we know they're going to be areas of focus in our strategy. Uh, there's also a key bit of work to do around data quality, completeness, so that our measures are robust and reliable as well as being appropriate and relevant. So lots to do. I think grateful for those uh, board members who've noted it's a, it's a good start. Uh, that's absolutely uh, you know, where we think it is and there's lots of work to do. So I look forward to uh, developing the report and co-producing that. Uh, I think we also mentioned sort of uh, experience and, and, and citizen 
uh, data as well as a key area for development. So I'll go away and start to work that into our plans and uh, offer out invites uh, to, to develop that. If there are any further comments on the, the, the large report, on reflection that people want to send over to me after the meeting, please just feel free to get in contact. Thank you, Chair. And there's a second bullet point under your item. It, have you covered that as I well? I have not, Chair, I'm afraid. That's okay. a whole other presentation. Okay. Okay, so the second uh, presentation... And just if you wouldn't mind putting the microphone a bit closer, please. A bit closer, yeah. It's kind of squeaking a bit so in protest. Okay, um, so the second presentation I've got for you uh, this morning, Board, is a, a summary uh, presentation for the uh, ICS's uh, operational plan for 22-23. So just by way of context, uh, the NHS every year issues operational planning guidance um, uh, both to its uh, providers and also to its uh, CCGs and latterly uh, it's asked ICSs to lead the planning round on behalf of its uh, footprint involving all of its uh, providers and commissioners and so uh, the, the planning round tends to begin some point in the winter there's a long tradition of the planning gui guidance being issued on Christmas Eve in the NHS um, and uh, it's usual that the plan is uh, concluded uh, around March time uh, this year uh, I think recognising uh, the coming of ICBs, we were actually going to talk the 20th of June, so uh, that's why you're receiving this as a presentation rather than a paper, because it was only submitted uh, just a day or so before the, the paper deadline. So I'm just going to take you through some very uh, short headlines of, of the operational plan, and then again, happy to take any questions or comments. So uh, this is a, a very uh, short um, summary of the key points uh, of the areas that the plan covers. Um, I'm going to draw out a few headlines. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, John, to take you through the headlines of the finance plan in a moment. So I won't say too much. I feel I shouldn't even steal his th thunder and read the first bullet point there that we do have a balanced plan. I'm sure he'll talk to you about that shortly. Um, I'll also talk you through uh, the workforce plan uh, in brief. Um, the activity and performance plan, so this, this slide aims to give you a sort of rounded picture that we do have an activity plan that meets uh, the ask uh, in the operational plan guidance that we deliver 104% weighted, uh, value weighted activity. Now, you may be wondering what on earth that means, and what it means is that compared to the levels of activity that our providers uh, delivered in uh, the year 1920, measured against that, so obviously a period that was pre-pandemic, the ask this year is that they uh, deliver 104%, so 4% more, but uh, that's not just counted in terms of activity uh, numbers, but also in value, so that uh, it takes account of some of the more complex operations, for example, um, that, that, that uh, take, take place rather than just perhaps trying to do large numbers of, of more simple operations to meet the target. So it tries to take account of the complexity of activity that needs to be restored and actually the, the need to exceed pre-pandemic uh, activity levels because of the rising demand on the health service. Um, the uh, plan also meets uh, an ambition to increase diagnostic activity, so that's diagnostic tests, everything from uh, plain film chest x-rays through to things like CTs and MRIs. Um, to 120% of the uh, volume of activity that was done in uh, 1920. Um, there are a couple of areas where we don't meet the national ambition. Uh, we've covered some of this in the performance report already. So I mentioned that we were unable to meet the ambition to completely eliminate weights of over 104 weeks uh, by June. Uh, and I mentioned that the exceptions were around the spinal pathways. And indeed, that same problem means that we're not able to uh, plan to fully eliminate weights of over 78 weeks or a year and a half by the end of March. Uh, that's not to say that we're not still working on solutions, and I know the Provider Collaborative uh, are working with uh, and both in, inside of our patch and also with parts from outside our patch to, to explore every, every avenue for that. But we do have a small cohort of patients that uh, unfortunately may still wait over that 78-week period by the end of the year. And I also mentioned earlier some of the exceptions around the mental health plan, where we are seeing growth in service provision, but not at a speed that meets the national asks, and indeed meets the rising demand uh, in that sector in a number of areas. Uh, we undertake an activity called triangulation as part of our planning processes, and the purpose of that is to make sure that we have, for example, a workforce plan that meets um, the needs of the activity plan that we've set, um, and indeed that we've got a financial plan that meets the needs of the workforce and activity plans that we've got. So 
that's just by way of summary, and I'm just going to hand over to John now to take you through the finance plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we need, as a board, to um, orient ourselves fairly quickly to, in terms of where we are with where we are with finance. So, um, to start that process, I'll take you through um, briefly some of the key points from from the recently completed uh, planning process. Well, we can talk a bit more about this when we look at the budget setting pro uh, paper as well. Um, so we needed to do two things uh, at a very high level and and one is we need to remain within our allocation statutorily as a as an integrated care board the other thing we're expected to do is submit a balanced plan across the ics so that includes all the nhs provider organizations as well um, and did we do that in terms of our planning? Uh, yes, yes, we did. Um, and you can see there on the slide a breakdown across the provider organisations, which total a deficit of 2.6 million uh, and a corresponding surplus of 2.6 million in the ICB. So, so in balance uh, overall. Um, in terms of capital expenditure, we have a plan which is currently above our allocation, but that assumes slippage, which which is 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 reasonable in in the field of capital expenditure. But one point to note is we're still finalising those numbers with NHS England, so there are live conversations um, going on there. I think it is interesting to note the change in this year uh, when when compared with 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 last year, where we saw. Um, I think a, an easier financial position in terms of the surpluses that could be delivered uh, across CCGs and, and, and providers. Um, and at a very high level, um, what we have this year is a little bit less uh, income in the position uh, and also increased pay costs, particularly as providers are trying to build their capacity in order to address some of the things that, that we've, been, we've been talking about. Another interesting point to note, I think, in the plans is the level of uh, exceptional inflation. Uh, and um, this, in particular, the 40, 42 million that we've identified there is in relation to energy costs and uh, PFI costs. PFI costs tend to be uh, linked to um, RPI, so linked to inflation in some form or other. Uh, and, and I think we're probably well aware of the increase that we've seen in energy costs. And, we have been shielded a little bit from, from that because uh, most of our providers are in fixed uh, energy contracts, which, which means we haven't quite seen the full impact of that. So there's a lot to look at there as we, we move forward. We have planned efficiencies um, across, the, across the NHS of 3.5%. That falls into our risks uh, in terms of delivery. That is quite a challenge. Um, other risks that we've we've identified are around the elective rec recovery funds. So Jacqueline mentioned um, needing to hit that 104% in order in order for us to earn that resource. So, you know, there is a risk that if we don't hit that, we won't we won't earn that uh, that resource. Looking slightly further forward. Um, in the plans, there's quite a lot uh, a reliance on non-recurrent measures, so things that are in place for this year, but we will need to find a solution um, when we look forward to, to, to future years. So, you know, just to be clear on this and, 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 and avoid any doubt, we are in a very challenging financial environment here, uh, and uh, delivering this plan, these plans across the patch, will, will require some very careful management over the next few months, and alongside that, a really robust planning process to allow us to, to get on a sustainable footing for um, next year and beyond, so that we can deliver the things that we want to deliver and the things that we've been talking about today. So I'm going to stop there and, and hand back to, to Jacqueline. Chair, do you want me to finish the presentation and then take questions yeah. on the whole thing? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay, so then just to take you briefly through other key aspects of the plan, this is a very high level uh, workforce plan summary. Um, and what this is telling you is that within our plans, uh, we, have, uh, we are aiming to increase our substantive workforce, that's people who have a contract of employment to work for the NHS, by 3.8%. Um, and that's an establishment change of one39 so that means that we're both planning to both recruit to existing vacancies and create additional posts as well. And then if you look at the uh, bank and agency figures, you'll see that uh, if we're, as we're planning to be successful in filling quite a lot of vacancies, so we are 
uh, planning a correspondent reduction in our bank and agency spend. And at the bottom there, you can see that within our plans that specifically for primary care, we've got an ambition to grow our workforce by 1.26%. I'm not going to go through these slides in a huge amount of detail, Chair, because we think we covered a lot of this in the performance report, but I thought it was important and helpful to go through all of the key national asks, that's to say the things that the, uh, the NHS nationally, NHS England, has set as requirements uh, for the NHS at large to deliver <coughs> during 2023, and then just draw out uh, what the ask is, what our local plan is, and whether it meets the ask or not. Um, so I'll just uh, give you a couple of short exception reports, if I may, where we haven't covered them in detail before. So the first uh, blue, interesting choice of colour, X there, is uh, the aim that we have a 25% reduction in outpatient follow-ups uh, by March, 22, uh, March 23. And you can see there that we're some way off uh, that our plan is actually to uh, reduce down to 94.2%. Uh, and again, this is relative to, to 1920. Um, I think this has been a target that's been found challenging up and down the country for a number of reasons, uh, partly because organisations are carrying follow-up backlogs um, in the wake of the pandemic, but also, obviously, as we increase activity relative to previous periods, so that comes with a quotient of follow-up activity. There are opportunities to do some um, transformation in this space, and I know there's a lot of activity going on in the providers looking at new pathways and new ways of working. This target is in action from, from March 23, so uh, you know, there's, there's still opportunity to do further work on this, and I know that's going on. Um, I think I've covered the um, long waiters and cancer exceptions in my earlier pre presentation, Chair, so I'll move on. Uh, this is a summary of the national ambitions for mental health, um, and this gives you the sort of detail behind the, the commentary that I gave you early in the performance report that we have some challenging uh, targets around increasing capacities across a range of our mental health services. Uh, we have uh, met a number of them, but there are others where we're not quite meeting uh, the ambition. In some, we're getting pretty close. I did follow up, uh, for example, on this slide. Uh, there's an ambition that two thirds of the estimated number of people with dementia in England should have a diagnosis and, a po and an appropriate post-diagnostic support arrangement in place. Um, so two-thirds would be 66.66 reoccurring, and our plan is 66.4. So just, just uh, uh, shorter of the ask. Um, I, I understand uh, that there's been a huge amount of work on this. My colleagues to my left may know more about it, uh, and there's still further work going on, but that represents a very detailed plan, um, and so that's where we've landed. But you can see that the uh, you know, services that are working hard to meet these targets, and no doubt we'll be uh, uh, covering this further in future meetings. There are recovery plans uh, in place uh, for those exception reports. Okay, and then this is a range of uh, other uh, targets that sit um, in the uh, operating plan guidance this year. Uh, the only one that we've got an exception report against here is that the increase of annual health checks for people aged 14 um, on over who are on a GP uh, register as having a learning disability. And the national aim is that uh, by next year, by 23 24, that will be 75%. Uh, we've got a pretty uh, long way to go on this, and I'm sure this relates to some of the earlier conversations we've been having around the pressures in primary care, uh, and no doubt we'll be doing further work on this as a system over the coming weeks and months. Um, lots of detail on this slide here, and I, I'm happy to take questions, but this just gives you the real detail behind the various uh, service lines or points of delivery uh, that make up uh, the recovery plan for the 18-week referral to treatment target. So you can really see in detail there, at uh, the top, um, the, the amount of activity that we're looking to deliver relative to 1920. Um, and so in total, uh, 100 for 4 percent in terms of, if you like, uh, counting individual activities. Um, you've also got the ambitions there around non-elective, around A&E, um, and uh, at the bottom there, you've got uh, the specifics in terms of the planned reductions in waiting times against those long waiting targets. I think uh, my colleague John covered a bit of this, but this is a very high-level summary, again, of the key risks, which you know, is underpinned by a much more detailed uh, risk register. Uh, John, you mentioned uh, the, the challenges in the financial position, both in terms of revenue and capital, and also uh, that key point that um, delivering uh, some of our income this year is contingent on meeting that 104% uh, activity plan by value. 
Uh, we've already touched uh, this afternoon a number of times on uh, a range of workforce issues, um, and uh, so that's not just about whether we've got uh, sufficient numbers of staff, but as Andy was referring to earlier, um, how our staff are feeling after a number of uh, really tough years and how that might affect uh, both recruitment and retention going forward. Clearly, as we sit here today, we haven't uh, co-produced and landed that integrated care strategy, and so there are some risks around us making key decisions in the absence of that, and we're very cognizant of that. We know that urgent emergency care pressures remain extremely high, and also that we continue to have a very high number of medically fit patients in hospital awaiting discharge, and that, of course, relates to the uh, concomitant pressures in our care system across the board, uh, both in domiciliary care and uh, in our care homes. Uh, and we've also already looked at some of the data around some of the handover delays and response time issues for our ambulance service. So that remains a key risk for us. Uh, our urgent and emergency care network and our individual providers with colleagues and partners in place are working tirelessly on this, but we do uh, remain very concerned about the pressures across the system. Uh, similarly, we are managing some significant pressures in mental health service while trying to deliver those long-term plan uh, commitments, and we recognise the impact of the, the long waits in some of those services. Um, an overall risk you'll not be su surprised uh, to hear in, in recognition of those pressures is how do we strike that balance, meet those urgent emergency care pressures while continuing to sustain uh, recovery of the elective service volumes and uh, reducing waiting times. So, Real high level set of risks there, but I thought it was just useful to round all of that up and, of course, draw out the interrelationship between those matters. So I think that's the uh, very quick summary. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Jacqueline. And I think just to emphasise that um, in relation to the first part of your presentation and this second part, that this this is the profile that we've inherited, uh, not just as far as performance is concerned, but the sort of metrics they're used and the way they're presented. So I think we've talked internally quite a bit about having, uh, trying to get a very transformative approach to uh, data and metrics, which gives uh, much more rapid and clearer insights. So, and, and Graham would have a big part to play in this. So, this that's one of certainly one of my priorities as well as uh, as uh, as Sam and the and Jacqueline and the team. So, we hope next time you see it. Um, there'll be the stats will be punching you on the nose rather than having to to look back and and, and see some of the detail okay um so any questions on that part of jacqueline's presentation we had a very full discussion on the first bullet point anything that anybody wanted to raise um, there and well, one bit of context which uh john you could provide us with um when you did this uh, important work in balancing the financial situation. What's the position around the rest of the country, just to know how good or bad we are? Um, it, it has been um, a long process in terms of getting here. Uh, and, you know, as Jacqueline said, um, the, the, the plans are normally done much earlier in the year. And part of that was trying to address that gap ac across the whole country. I think we were um, relatively at the better end of things in terms of in terms of the whole country in terms of the gap we had proportionately but of course we are the biggest icb so um i think there are still issues to address nationally as i understand yeah. it um most systems now have got to a balanced position so really the question is about the level of risk that systems are carrying okay. in terms of delivery i think we are at the better end of things but as i said it's still yeah. quite a challenging environment so when everybody went to meet the NHS Director of Finance, you were one of the ones that got coffee? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Vir Dave. Virtual coffee, I think yeah. it yeah. was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I think there's a huge amount of work gone into this, which uh, we just need to recognise. Uh, and I think you touched on it, Jacqueline, when you're presenting this. Um, this is very, very NHS-focused, and this is somebody speaking who's worked for the NHS since he left school. 
just not that long ago. Um, but seriously, I think in terms of this is necessary, but actually in terms of the ambition we've got as an ICB and thinking particularly of local authority and other partner colleagues, it's not sufficient to get to where we need to, but we do have to focus on this in the here and now to give us the headroom to get into that wider piece in terms of meeting the health inequalities and the engagement that we talked about earlier on. So important piece of work, but we need to go much, much further beyond this to meet our ambitions. Okay, thank you. Neil. Oh, sorry, it's Jackie, it's difficult to see where, who it's lined with. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I think that this follows on from really what David said. I think that, that there is something about, you know, obviously it, it feels like a reasonably strong position, but I think that, that in, in terms of kind of where we go next, there is something about particularly from a care perspective and, and social care perspective, understanding the shift in activity, particularly what feels like from health to social care, but I'm sure that, that health would say vice versa. So there's something about how we understand that. I think that the other part of it is that is as a system that kind of, I think that, that whilst, you know, there is a clear coherent plan around this, um, I think that the other part of it is particularly from an adult's perspective where you've got significant change ahead around some of the reform. So some of the issues about charging reform, some of the issues uh, about uh, fair cost of care and, and you know, the, the issues that John had alluded to around CPI and all of that, that has quite a significant implication in terms of local authorities. So there is something about how we jointly understand that across the whole of the system. Yeah, thank you very much. Mike. Firstly, regarding the outpatient follow-up um, metric, we just have to be careful with some of these metrics that we don't end up shifting work from one part of the system to another. So outpatient follow-up, I think we all, all recognise the, the antiquated model of the NHS of sometimes automatically following up patients is not necessary. And the, the, the innovations regarding patient-initiated follow-up, I think, are really welcomed. Um, but it's about co-producing these new innovations in a way that makes sure that it doesn't ripple in particular into general practice in this instance if patients aren't followed up because that, that, that can create extra work in the system in a, in a hidden way. And then the second point regarding the, the very ambitious targets for the bank and agency staff, so I guess a direct question as to, as to what, what incentives are we putting in place to, to achieve those drops of almost 50% in some cases. I feel that's a very ambitious. I'd love to see it happen, but I'm just a bit concerned that it does sound very, very ambitious. Okay, thank you. Anne. Um, just building on Jackie's point, really, in terms of um, the care market, um, but also thinking about discharge and the local authorities, because the, the majority of the work that we do is within communities, with individuals. Um, it's not all about hospital discharge. So just trying to make that uh, that point in, in terms of what else we can do and, and, and how we bring that into the fore. Thank you. Thank you. And um, David. Thank you. Just a, a very general point. Um, are we spending sufficient time on social care, you know, care homes and um, care in the home because that is so important you know, for the health service and most of the debate has been on health and social care and the implications, the planning for that. Uh, not too much has been mentioned is have we got the balance right in terms of health vis-a-vis -vis the social care aspect of uh, of life in the health and care services. Jackie, you look like you want to come in on that point. Um, yeah, so I think that, that there is an opportunity through this to kind of add um, that picture into this and, and, and try to, to balance some of the um, kind of the, the issues that we've got between acute and, and social care. So that, that's kind of one opportunity that I think the ICS has got. I think that the, the second issue is, in, and John will tell us if I'm wrong, but my understanding is, is that predominantly the additional funds that are coming into local authority, and in particular to adult social care, will be directed via the ICS. So again, it, it, it opens up that opportunity to really understand what some of the issues and priorities are, but also to make sure that the, the resources are allocated appropriately. Okay, thank you. Neil? Uh, just my point was very quick on, um, on the 
LV health checks. Uh, historically, performance at this time of year is usually very poor, and um, there's a mad rush in quarter four, which is not the right way to do it. I've had conversations with our learning disability network, um, and we're looking to try and get a, a better approach. The vast majority of the health check doesn't actually need to be done by general practice. We really would like to, and I went to a really interesting presentation which was hosted by Bola Boala from uh, Health and Qualities Lead at um, NHS England. And there's some models around the country where the voluntary sector um, are doing 90% of the health check um, and then just referring um, uh, individuals on to health services if and when needed. So there's some new ways in which we can do this, but we are actively looking at it. It's a big priority. Okay, thank you. Mark. Thanks, Chair. Um, just thinking about some of the discussions we've had about workforce um, and thinking about the comments that Anne and Jack, Jackie have been making, I just think there's a real opportunity for us to think about, about workforce development jointly between the NHS and, and the care market. organisation and our new ways of working together. Thank you. Sam. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just really wanted to kind of talk about risk and strategic priorities because I think um, it's really helpful that we've got the baseline predominantly of the NHS state here and I think we're all agreed that we could have a much more balanced view of the whole system. We, we, we really hear on a daily basis the challenges, particularly in the care sector, um, whilst the NHS workforce, we're expanding, the care sector is getting increasingly challenging, particularly as people take decisions to, to leave the care sector to go and work for other organisations where the hourly rate of pay is much higher than we're able to offer. Um, so we have some opportunities. I think what this data though says to me is we've got to we've got to change the way we do things. We've got to transform the system. We've got a situation where our hospitals have never been working with the level of occupancy that they're working with today. We've heard about the pressures of the elective recovery plan, and I don't think we have fully understood, therefore, the knock-on implications for our social care colleagues in terms of increasing. Um, that activity um, and the implications really for the, for the wider care sector but also on social care. I think what this data is really telling me is the importance of our, of our strategy, of our, our strategic work over the next few months to think about actually how we're going to do some of this differently because we cannot quite simply, particularly in the constrained financial environment, I think John your point, we are this year dealing with slightly less resources than we've had in previous years, keep working the system in terms of the way it's set up in the way we're doing at the moment so I think for us as a board strategically the strategy is a big priority and I also think it's really helpful to see our risks set out and I do want to recognize the the risks in terms of the financial plan that we've put together and the efficiencies I do think it's a stretching but realistic efficiency target and chair we John and I are aware of other systems that have four to five percent efficiency targets. We didn't think that would be realistic or achievable, but nonetheless, it's still stretching. So we'll have to keep a very close eye on the finances on a month to month basis. But with, for me, this signals the need for transformation and change across the system. Ken, how, how does this compare to the, the sorts of points that the fi foundation trusts are looking at? It, uh, to a large extent, mirrors exactly the conversation we're having. Um, I think that all of us would probably recognise that we can't keep doing what we're doing. We can build bigger hospitals, we can build more A&E departments, you call it what you like, but that's not the solution, is it? But we're in a difficult workforce position, as we've acknowledged already. Um, Mike, you asked the question about HC spend. Yeah, there's some risk in those numbers. I'm sure John would would confirm that, uh, and by the sign of it, Sue's recruited all the consultants that are available anyway to go to, <laughs> to, go to, to Teesside if she's got 90 of them. That's great for Teesside, but it makes a point, doesn't it, yeah. that actually that might say stabilise Teesside, but undoubtedly will cause some pressures elsewhere yeah. in the system. Um, I should add just an agency, there are some extra controls now, I think, being put back into the system this year on the spend that a individual organisations can make on agencies. Now, you may look upon that as a double-edged sword, you know, if it's, if it's 10 o'clock on a Saturday evening and we need an agency doctor urgently in ED, you know what we're going to do if we're not in a position of making sure that shift is safe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are some tensions, dilemmas, but I think, Liam, the provider sector want to do things differently. Um, we know we can't rely on the same old um, 
style of delivery, particularly reliance on some aspects of workforce. Um, I would say as well that there's some issues I think we should rightly be asking our national colleagues to help us with as well. So reflecting for a second or two on outpatients and follow-ups as an example. We have bodies like NICE that actually are quite prescriptive in terms of the guidance they give to some of our clinical colleagues about how they operate. So if I take a head and neck surgeon in our organisation, she will say to me that NICE is telling me that I have to see follow-up patients with head and neck cancer 10 times over a period of time. Now, I think it used to be prescribed in our national our standard contract that actually we had to follow NICE guidance, and most clinicians would probably intuitively want to do that. But actually, we need some of those rules to change to help us also tackle some of these uh, targets around the 25% that uh, Jacqueline uh, mentioned. So I think, Liam, you'll find that the, the mood in the provider collaborative is very much about we can't keep doing what we're doing, we've got to change. The issue is how do we get that change embedded whilst we're keeping the show on the road? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay, uh, Jacqueline, any final comments from you? nine months time looking at our uh, plan for 23-24 we'll have a much rounder plan that will be reflecting our ambitions for the first year of our five-year integrated care strategy and we'll have that broader view uh, of all of the uh, priorities uh, for the health and care um, service and uh, and for our population rather than perhaps something that's uh, Fairly, sticking fairly closely to the priorities that have been prescribed nationally. <coughs> but thanks very much. Okay, well, thank you everybody for that discussion. That was very, very helpful and insightful, actually. Um, John, I think the next item is yours. Yeah, uh, we've covered the first bullet in, in that presentation, yes. so I'll, I'll move on to budget setting, uh, if that's okay. So under the uh, standing financial instructions that we uh, adopted... Are you showing uh, slides for this one? No, no, this, no. Is, okay. this is the budget setting paper. So... Um, under the standing financial instructions that we adopted earlier in the day, we need to approve um, ICB budgets to allow us to incur expenditure. This paper uh, does acknowledge the wider ICS, but it's really focused on the, on the ICB itself. Um, there is some detail in the paper, but, but I'll highlight just a few things from the report. Um, the first thing is the 4.9 billion allocation, for, and that's just for the nine-month period uh, of, of, of this year, the remaining nine months of the ICB, and the 2.6 million surplus, which is in the plan there for the whole year. Uh, this has been prepared under national guidance, but informed by um, the knowledge and uh, local knowledge and expertise of the, the preceding CCGs. Um, some points to note from the national guidance, uh, the continued focus on elective recovery, which we've touched on a few times today, and the delivery of long-term plan objectives. The reduced uh, reduce COVID funding uh, when compared with, with 2021 and the cessation of the hospital discharge program. In terms of risks, and this is this is becoming a bit more specific to the to the ICB itself, um, but similar sort of themes to the broader ICS, the delivery of efficiencies uh, and whether the performance in terms of, of uh, uh, overall across the ICS is sufficient for. Um, the ICS and ICB to earn sufficient uh, elective recovery funding to cover to cover the amount identified in the plan. These and other risks will be managed uh, throughout the year, and we will report performance on a regular basis to to the board. So we were asking for here um, approval of the ICB budgets. Okay. Do people feel happy to approve that? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Right, um, we're on to item 10 now, and um, that's the CCG Close Down and Due Diligence Assurance Report. And back to you, Claire. Thanks, Chairman. I think the report is self-explanatory. This is for assurance, uh, not for agreeing. It gives you an up-to-date position with regards to the CCG Close Down. Um, there's lots of work under being undertaken across all of the clinical commissioning groups, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, are you happy to approve that? Thank you. And we're on now to the schedule of meetings. This is for information. 
and uh, I'm sure there'll be other meetings, but we are very conscious that this isn't your day job uh, for most of you, and uh, we will be careful about organizing additional meetings and only do so if we feel they will add value. But there are a lot of things, I think, um, today and in our minds where um, a deeper dive into some of these subjects without a lot of papers and um, analysis would help us to get on the right road for then the executive taking work forward, uh, whether it's very broad initiatives like rural health, coastal health, we've, we've talked a little bit about that. I think there's some things where we could be very, very innovative, particularly with um, matters to do with population health and access to services, and it'd be nice to be able to do those. But as I say, uh, we'll get you in um, only when we feel it's a good use of your time and, and, and your expertise. But the schedule of official meetings so far is, is set out there for information. Um, we're on to item 12 now. Could I ask if there is any other business? No? Well, I think we can now conclude the public meeting and thank you all for uh, a very, very good and inspiring start to the work of the Integrated Care Board for the North East and North Cumbria. Thank you. Yeah.